Being with your change log is provided by Fastly. Learn more at Fastly.com. We move fast and fix things here at ChangeLog because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode is brought to you by Linode, our cloud server of choice. It is so easy to get started with Linode. Servers start at just five bucks a month. We host ChangeLog on Linode cloud servers and we love it. We get great 24 seven support. Zeus like powers with native SSDs, a super fast 40 gigabit per second network and incredibly fast CPUs for processing. And we trust Linode because they keep it fast. They keep it simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Welcome to 2019, everyone. Yes, we're here. We've arrived. This is our first show back, and I'm excited about it. This is the change log. We feature the hackers, the leaders, and the innovators of software development. And I'm Adam Stachowiak, Editor-in-Chief here at Changelog. And on today's show, we're actually going back in the past to 2018. Recently at KubeCon, Cloud Native Con 2018 in Seattle, Washington. And I sat down with Brendan Burns, the co-creator of Kubernetes and also partner architect at Microsoft Azure. Brendan and I talked about the state of Kubernetes, the importance of community, building healthy cloud platforms, and last but not least, the future of cloud infrastructure. The last time we talked was in Austin. Right. You had your comrade there, Gabe Onroy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about like sort of the direction obviously of Kubernetes, but I thought it'd be interesting to come back a year later. Because sure. that, that conference, I don't know how much you remember from a year ago, I'm sure your life is a little blurry these days. It was days. snowy, I remember it snowed. It did snow for the first time in Texas in a while. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, it been it a while. never snows in Texas, yeah, yeah, yeah. let alone uh, Austin. But yeah, we did actually have some snow. Um, more of a state of, of Kubernetes. I mean, you've been here since the birth, obviously one of the founders sure. of, of, the, of the project. Uh, during that conversation, I did ask you something, and I don't I don't mind if you forget some of the things, I'm sure you do tons of interviews, <laughs> but, but I asked you like, you know, your temptation to keep it sure speaking of kubernetes rather than like open sourcing it or taking to you know taking these ideas and plant them to google and the way that sure. it's rolled out you know and your response essentially was like no i'm actually really happy with yeah. open sourcing it because like you see a lot of a lot of people a lot of developers have really good ideas yeah. release a portion of it as open source and build this gigantic company around it yeah, yeah, yeah. and you could have been the kind of person who was maybe I don't want to say selfish, but maybe self-thinking, and did that with Kubernetes. I don't know. I'm not, I'm not sure it succeeds, actually. No? Right. Like, I mean, I actually think that the reason we're all here is, you know, is because of the ecosystem and because we've enabled this large group of people to bet their success on this open platform, right? right. And I actually don't think, I think if you, you try and hold on to it, you try and be too tight with it, like, it doesn't succeed. Like I, I think that's the lesson of cloud, in my mind anyway, is that yeah. if it's not open, and it's it's not gonna win ultimately. Um, and and so so yeah, I don't know. I don't actually think that. I mean, it, it wasn't a choice that I was interested in, no matter what. Um, but I'm actually not even sure that if you make that choice, it because I mean, if you if you cast your mind back, actually, in the moment leading up to you know when we first announced it. There were a lot of different orchestrators out there, a lot of different projects, right? Yeah. A lot of different approaches. Um, many of whom, you know, only the people who are sort of paying attention even noticed, right? Um, and and I think that the reason that five years later we're here, you know, with seventy five hundred people is because it's not the tech; it's the community and the 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 fact that it really could be something that everybody could bet on um, is the reason why it survived. Um, I, I don't, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm a big believer that, that open always wins, that community always wins. And you know, it takes longer than others sometimes. It takes a while sometimes. Yeah. But, but um, 
What do you so, think gave you that feeling, though? You know, you say very... Uh, uh, you, say, you use words like always. Yeah, 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 you know, yeah. Like every time, always. Those are... Well, I, <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm, I am guilty. I have to admit, I'm guilty of using words like that a lot. I speak very definitively yeah, at times. Yeah, that's and why maybe I'm asking, like, like where, how maybe, did you maybe, learn maybe, that? Maybe, maybe it's more definitive than... Or maybe I believe it's more definitive than, than it is. Um, but, I mean, I think you look back and you look at... Um, you know, I, I, some of my first experiences in open source... Um, were sort of in the height of the FreeBSD, Linux, sort of FUD wars, whatever, in the sort of late 90s, early 2000s. There was a, you know, it was, it's a big, big thing going on. Like, people would, are you, you know, do you use BSD or whatever? Um, and I, I think one of the things that really I took out of that was that that the community that developed around Linux was more supportive it was more open, um, and the ecosystem just was more available to people. Um, and I think ultimately that's why, you know, Linux ends up being the success that it is. And and you know, FreeBSD is still out there for sure, right? But it's not, it's not like it was in 1999 where right. it's it was sort of the a horse race. Is. Yeah, it's it's clear, right? It's clear who the winner was. Um, and and I and so I, I I paid a lot of attention to that. Um, I think that there's other, you know, there's a lot of other examples. Um, I think the Hadoop ecosystem is another really great example of like, you know, lots of different companies sort of being able to come in and bet themselves on that ecosystem. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, and 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 also companies being willing to step in and develop in-house expertise in in that, you know, that software and that technology. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, that's sort of, and in smaller scale too, you can look at things like, you know, Ruby on Rails or any, you know, any of these other kinds of, you know, every, every I feel like every single one of the important cloud-based projects has been open source at its core. Um, and, and I think it's just, it's a necessity. I don't know. Uh, I got I got one comeback to that, but I want right. to go here no, that's first. Fair. Um, I will go. We'll go to the comeback first, All right. and we'll pause on the other one. So when I was in this analyst meeting, just re just um, it, it was talked about how you know you got a graduated project. When we talked about the CNCF, for example, sure. you got graduated projects, which is what Kubernetes is. Right. You've got incubator projects, which, which are in the incubation stage, and then I don't know what this last Sand, one sandbox. is. Sandbox. Sandbox. Even more, even less incubated than incubating. So everyone that has has been graduated began as open source, and they talked about. Well, hey, if you know if you've got ideas around this pathway, you know, this this you know CNCF landscape, this cloud native landscape, um, the way to get in essentially is to create something open source that's useful, yeah, right, that has adoption. So, yeah. you know, speaking to that, that's the exact recipe for yeah. essentially having a project that matters in this world, this particular world here. Yeah, yeah, Not yeah like yeah. the world at large, but sure. this Kubernetes cloud native world. Yeah. Yeah, no, and I think that's true. I mean, I, I'm not going to say that it has to be every project. I mean, I think you look at things like SQL Server, right? Massively successful database, totally, you know, not not open source. I think you can certainly build useful, interesting software that, that yeah. a lot of people use. Um, uh, but I but I think that in the world of infrastructure, where you're where you're not using it, well, you're using it, but you're running on it. You really want to be able to understand it and debug it. And participate in it, and, and it it's a platform. It yeah. really needs to be open. I don't know. That's that's my yeah, it makes sense. My my feeling, Do you uh, get especially because it's such a hybrid world, right? Like it's people need to know that they can run the same app in multiple different places. Right. Open really helps with that. So. Does licensing ever come up for you when you talk about open? So whenever you have certain projects out there, um, you know, using like Commons clause or just yeah ways to not be cannibalized by the big guys or the big people, so to speak. Yeah, I mean, know? I think this is a real risk um, for a lot of people. Is because that's um, what happens at infrastructure levels, like you know. Yeah, no, we it's, build it's, it, we it's, can't make money from it. It's tough, and and I think that I actually feel like as a cloud provider, if we're not creating a platform that you can make money on as a independent software vendor, like long term we're making a mistake, right? And I think one of the great, you know, it's attributed to, to, to Bill Gates, but like one of the things he said early on was, you know, for every dollar that Microsoft makes, our partners have to make $10, mm. right? And I think if you don't have that vision, right, if you don't have that notion that if you're building a platform, the only 
to build a successful platform, you have to enable people to make other people to make money on it. You can't be right. always cannibalizing their stuff, right? I don't know that we're there in cloud yet, um, but I think we really should try and get there. Any risks coming up that you're aware of around this around this concern? Well, I think as cloud providers, we actually have to build infrastructure for those ISVs. So the right? independent so like, clouds are providers have to have this right I think feeling. we I think we have to adopt the belief that we're not just providing infrastructure for infrastructure consumers but we're actually providing infrastructure for ISV app developers um, so you know in Azure right now we have this thing called managed applications that is it's not I actually have a bunch of teams that aren't Kubernetes teams um, and one of those teams does this work on this thing called managed applications and it's really all about how do we build a platform for independent software vendors to be able to successfully and scalably sell their software on, on Azure, right. right? And actually, I think Kubernetes is a big part of that because the challenge of selling software is the, op, is the making it reliable and operable at scale, right? Um, it's great if I can sell 10 copies of my software, but if I have to ha you know, have a, a person on call for every one of those copies, I, I don't really have a very scalable business, right? And I think Kubernetes enables people to containerize their applications and potentially run them very reliably without a lot of interference from an operator um, at, at a much higher scale. Um, and so I'm sort of, that was sort of one of the motivations for doing it in the first place was to provide this infrastructure platform for application developers to build on top of. Like if you think about someone who sells software on a CD, right? Uh, every copy of that CD doesn't really incur much in the way of operations cost. I mean, maybe they have a support center somewhere, but like they don't. Every time they sell a new copy of that software, mm -hmm. it's not like they think, "Oh my God, I'm gonna have to hire a new yeah, right. SRE to like take care of it for me." But like in the distributed systems world, it's kind of like that, right? Either you build a for SaaS, every new customer, you have a cost. Yeah, like for yeah. every customer, there's a little bit of consulting, a little bit of like operations you have to do. It's it's very linear, and it's that means your business is it's hard to scale your business. And and I I view that as an infrastructure problem. We're not supplying the right infrastructure to these software develop software vendors to enable them to manage their software at scale. And so I hope that Kubernetes, and especially managed Kubernetes, like in the Azure Kubernetes service, provides that provides that sort of application oriented infrastructure, makes it easy to build and scale your 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 app. So any I don't particular know. good stories around managed applications? Like what's just a, a great example of a managed application and why? Um, so, like, we built a really great partnership with Databricks, um, for example, in Azure. Um, so, Databricks is a big data, data warehouse kind of streaming analytics solution. And, you know, fundamentally, it's a piece of software that that company built. And now they've been able to turn it into a product inside of Azure without being, you know, they're still an independent company. They're still, you know, doing their thing and running on all sorts of different clouds and on-prem. But by using managed applications, they've been able to... Uh, integrated into the Azure API in a way that makes it more native to Azure than it is if they just sort of installed it right. um, on. And it makes it more operable, too, because we can we can enable people, their operators, to gain access to all of the resources that are being deployed in Azure mm -hmm. um, to support it. So that's a, that's a, that's a, a, a pretty successful example that, that we've built. But we have a bunch of different other partners who are using uh, who are using managed applications um, like databases stuff like that that sort of things or or you know people like chef um, yeah. and other sorts of, of people who, are, who have to have like a server component that they want to deploy into um, everybody's you know an end user subscription if they're going to be a, a customer is there anybody that can actually just build their business you know say their application runs on Azure but that's the only place it runs they, they actually build it to run in Azure as yeah. an independent company I think at this point, all of the ISVs know that they need to be multi-cloud, right? And well, so, I don't mean that is not multi-cloud. I mean it is like maybe just simply like their stuff only runs in, in yeah, and you know on the cloud for oh uh, yeah yeah under a provider, not even under their they don't even have managed. It's yeah, little no, software built inside of managed yeah and uh, I, services for example. And I and I think that that's sort of. I suspect that that's sort of where, where, we're, where we're headed, where you take a managed Kubernetes cluster, you lay on some application code, you use some of our map, managed application infrastructure, and you actually literally can sell that as a product. Wow. Um, and we actually help you monetize it, yeah. right? So like we actually help with the billing relationships and, and that sort of stuff. So I think, and, I, and I think as a cloud provider, that's an obligation. I see that as an obligation that we have, right? Um, I think it's good for our long-term health. Um, as a computing industry, but I think if all we do is sell infrastructure to the direct consumer, right, if it's just to the person who's building the system, 
I don't think we've built a healthy, we haven't built a healthy ecosystem. You need a healthy ISV, independent software, yeah. developer, vendor ecosystem. And, and I do worry, actually, that we're, we don't do enough with some of these open source companies to help them build scalable business models. Interesting. Um, so you're doing more of that now as part of... Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's a big, like, part, building... Or a long-term goal. I think it's a long-term goal. I think it's a focus for Azure to build um, an environment in which our partners can be successful, right. financially successful, yeah. be vested in their success. I think that's, historically, that's always been something that Microsoft has been good at, partnering well with companies, yeah. ensuring that they can make money on our platform. It's, I, I think it's an important differentiator for, for our cloud, for sure. This episode is brought to you by Clubhouse. One of the biggest problems software teams face is having clear expectations set in an environment where everyone can come together to focus on what matters most, and that's creating software and products their customers love. The problem is that software out there trying to solve this problem is either too simple and doesn't provide enough structure, or it's too complex and becomes very overwhelming. Clubhouse solves all these problems. It's the first project management platform for software teams that brings everyone together. It's designed from the ground up to be a developer first product in its DNA, but also simple and intuitive enough that all teams can enjoy using it. With a fast, intuitive interface, a simple API, and a robust set of integrations, Clubhouse seamlessly integrates with the tools you use every day and gets out of your way. Learn more and get started at clubhouse.io slash changelog. Our listeners get a bonus two free months after your trial ends. Once again, clubhouse.io slash changelog. And just people, community, things like that, and the importance level of it for us in our business here at Change Law. Like one thing we do is partner well, not only with community members but also with different brands that need our help to share their story, sure. tell them develop, developer culture stories, and just yeah. the stories about these different brands. Just have a hard time, yeah, telling more than their core competencies. Like yeah, actually yeah, yeah. making them, you know, far more human than they're able to in other avenues. Yeah. And one thing I often have to tell people about our perspective when it comes to partnerships and our DNA is that we're here to raise the tide of everyone. You know, you can't go around building a great city knocking yeah. people's buildings down. Right? Yeah, yeah, like yeah. If my job, let's say I was a Microsoft employer, you in the in the role you have, you're not going around knocking people's buildings down. You're helping them lift exactly. their buildings up. Exactly. You're making sure streetlights are corrected, that the roads have yeah. no potholes, you know, whatever. All the things that make a city a good city. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you feel about that? No, like I think so. buildings down versus... I, I, I think it's really... Building it's, others. Yeah, it's a really important aspect. And, and I, it, because you waste so much energy in that stuff that's not helping anybody be successful. Yeah. Right? You're not helping anybody. Like, ultimately, at the end of the day, I... Like, what excites me, what has always excited me is enabling that user to be successful using software that I've built or I've helped build, right? And anything else in some ways is a waste of time. And so if you're tearing stuff down or you're focusing on anything other than making your stuff great, you're, I don't know, I feel like you're wasting, you're wasting your effort, right? Like mm -hmm. it's, no, it's no fun to win if it's a scorched earth. Right, like I that's like that. that's like yeah. at the end of the day, you're like you raise the flag and you're like I won, and then you look around, and you're like no one else, is no there. one else is here. Right? I mean, how is this? How is this? Is this really winning? What triumph is worth? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of, yeah. Of and, and I think that's the trouble is some yeah. people focus more on the winning than on the like empowering the user. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, it's great. I mean, I love the fact that we're here and there's 7,500 people here, and that's that's amazing, right? It's way better than me being in my basement and you know, being like look at my Kubernetes project. Like, right. I wish somebody would look at it, right? But as I said, at the, as sort of at the, at the get-go, I think we're here because we've had that take the high road, build people up sort of ethos. We've invited people in. We've invited people to, to join and to help and to find the place where they can contribute. I mean, we were just at the Contributor Summit yesterday, and we were celebrating 
a bunch of people who do like release management, who've done docs, who've run, you know, helped organize the task board for various special interest groups, like totally non-technical jobs, totally not distributed, so they, but they're, they're essential jobs to keeping the community going. And the fact that we've created a community where people volunteer for that and then get rewarded is, like that's why it's successful. So I don't know, I, I, and I'm a big believer in that. Well, I'm glad you brought it back to community because that was the tangent I wanted to go on earlier. Right. And what I wanted to ask you about that was that we hear the word community a lot. It's because of the community, and I don't, I'm not yeah, discarding yeah. that. I'm sort of tangentially just sort of like making fun of ourselves as we say this, but there's some people out there who are like, what do they mean by community? Right. So help me break down what community is at the cloud native level, the Kubernetes level. Like, what is a community member? Is it a user? Is it vendors? Like, how do you see successful community being implemented in, sure. the, in this community here? I think it's two. I mean, I think it's twofold. I think there's sort of two different layers of community. There's sort of the core Kubernetes contributor community, which, you know, we had like 400 people yesterday. Um, who are the people who are kind of day in and day out? This is their job, right? They're working on providing it as a service, or they're working on making it better, or working on integrating storage providers into the core project. Like, there's a small community that is really focused on building the project itself, the team, if you will, that builds the project. And that's an important community, but in some ways, it's more like any other traditional software team, right? I mean, it's different because it's distributed and lots of different. In, you know, not everybody works for the same company, and not, some people don't even work for anyone. Yeah. Um, and that's so it's a little bit different, but but it's sort of the same. And then I think what you're seeing here, you know, on the expo floor and 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 everywhere else, is the broader community, and that's the sort of the community of users, um, and the community of the people who have taken an existential bet on this technology. Right. I think. That's the, in some ways, the more interesting and powerful community, which is the people for whom this technology is the the way that they deliver their application, or it is the thing that their startup is based around, right? You know, a monitoring company that has said, "We're all in." Like, if you don't use Kubernetes, you can't use our software, right? Um, yeah, that's a community it. member. I mean, they're yeah. they're they're they are fully vested in this community's success because if it's not successful, then they can't. Uh, you know, they, their their company doesn't exist, no matter how awesome it is, right? No matter how awesome their thing is, if Kubernetes isn't successful, their their monitoring tech or whatever isn't going to be yeah. successful. Um, so I think it can be it can be vendors, and and I think that, but but I think the big thing is that everybody is sort of collectively vested in um, Kubernetes being successful and users being successful using Kubernetes. That's what makes the broader community being on Slack. Helping people out on Slack, helping out with the GitHub issues, you know, Stack Overflow, all of the sort of like mm -hmm. the traditional people helping each other stuff that you've seen happen, I think, in uh, in the developer community for a really long time, actually. Like, really, certainly from the advent of the internet and probably, you know, or the, the broad scale internet in the, in the mid 90s. Um, and probably even earlier on mailing lists and things like that, where people are, there's just a sense that we're gonna give advice and we're gonna help you learn to, you know, get through that error that you hit six months ago and all that sort of thing. I don't put up a silo and say, oh yeah, you're working for a competitor company. Like I'm not gonna help you with that Kubernetes error that you just hit. Like it's that kind of stuff that, yeah. that I think builds the builds That's, the community. When you were saying that was the interesting thing about the team, I was thinking like, that is kind of interesting because somehow you've magically been able to have probably highly influential people from various companies come together. Yeah. And then still not... It's hard. Enable or disable, you know, kind of clicks and access and yeah. politics. I mean, I wouldn't say that we're... I'm not going to get sure up here and be like... It, yeah, we're not going to be like, we're free of all that stuff. It's just like kumbaya, it happens. kumbaya all the time. But um, I think that we have been very lucky in the group of people who have, who were sort of in the initial leadership positions. Right. Um, and that once you, but, but, but that once you shape a culture, it kind of takes care of itself. Right. Um, and so I think that, you know, we had the steering committee summary at the end of um, the community meeting yesterday. 
and uh, you know we got up there and in another world you could imagine us being like here is the future direction of Kubernetes for the next 12 months we will do this 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 and we are the steering committee and we tell you what to do um, and instead we spent a long time talking about how our primary job is giving away responsibility and giving away power and giving and delegating to people and then yeah. and, and I think that when you do that uh, you know it's it's uh it's funny like if you know you might say well it's lazy to be like oh I'm just going to let you take care of that I'm not going to do it you, you take care of it but like when you do that to people they do such an awesome job because you've trusted them mm-hmm. right because you've given them this it's you've given them power but you've also told them that you trust them and they're going to do amazing things to validate your trust and so I don't know I, I think that's that's really helped I mean it's still like we still have bike shedding right. like I think I think we still have plenty of bike shedding discussions where we spend way too much time talking and not enough time doing and and sometimes we have fairly significant disagreements but I do think that there's a a level of respect amongst everybody that that is important um, to 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 the project for sure um, and I think unique actually I mean I think if there's anything that I'm proud of from the project it's it is that community that small community that culture that group of people that we built there it's i don't know it's a pretty special thing this episode is brought to you by raygun Raygun recently launched their application performance monitoring service, APM as it's called. It was built with the developer and DevOps in mind, and they are leading with first-class support for .NET apps and also available as an Azure app service. They have plans to support .NET Core, followed by Java and Ruby in the very near future. And they've done a ton of competitive research between the current APM providers out there, and where they excel is the level of detail they're surfacing. New Relic and App Dynamics, for example, are more business oriented, where Raygun has been built with developers and DevOps in mind. The level of detail in providing traces allows you to actively solve problems and dramatically boost your team's efficiency when diagnosing problems. Deep dive into root cause with automatic linkbacks to source for an unbeatable issue resolution workflow. This is awesome. Check it out. Learn more and get started at raygun.com APM. It seems like the the secret sauce is that somehow everyone who matters or can either destroy or build up the future of Kubernetes understands that hey if Kubernetes succeeds then your business has an opportunity to thrive or our business has an opportunity to thrive so that's our our treaty so to speak yeah you know, our our, uh, our nz so to speak yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, our dmz yeah yeah and i think that but i mean there's two different ways that that can end right that can end in sort of the mutually assured destruction cold war style okay, like sure. yeah. you know like yeah we're never going to mess with it but nobody's going to really like invest in it yeah. either um, or it can end up, I think, where we are, which is like we're going to really go and collaborate, raise all the boats. As I you like said. how you say bet. I mean, um, you really have said the word bet a couple of times. Like bet yeah. everything on the front yeah, yeah. that it's going to. And you have to, right? Like, I mean, that's 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 what it is, right? Like, yeah, it's rolling a dice. But that's for uh, sure. anything that's worth doing ends up being a bet like that. I think. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about some things you mentioned last year and, and contrast them against this year. Um, last year on stage, you mentioned MetaParticle was part of the future. What's the state of MetaParticle? Man, What's I'm still sad about MetaParticle. I just haven't had enough time. Okay. I'm still, I still think it's the future. Okay. Uh, I still think it's the future, but I, you know. Any movement on it? Any progress? I mean, I just here haven't heard the, much about here it. Here and there, but but in all honesty. Um, was it, it premature to mention it or announce it? No, I don't think it was premature because I think people are still talking about it. Right? And I think it was intended in some respects to... Um, to stir a conversation more than to turn into like I don't think I had any expectations it was going to become like the you know the the a huge project over the next year or whatever mm-hmm. um, uh, I do wish I'd had more time to spend on it um, I mean, real life kind of got in the way I guess um, uh, but but I do still think that there's an ongoing conversation that's that's happening in that space um, that's worth having that 
people, I still see people either talking to me at conferences like this or referencing it in documentation. Um, I hope I'll get, I guess it's one of those things that's on my list of like, I hope I'll get back to it someday. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yeah, that's, that's sort of where that's at. Is that, is that what you do on like nights and weekends? What do you, what's the night? It was, I mean, that was what I did. Yeah. So, um, nights and weekends, I, a lot, actually what I'm talking about today, um, I do a number of, I've been working a lot on, um, the Kubernetes client libraries for various languages yeah, yeah. in Kubernetes. Right. Um, and that's actually what my talk is at the end of the conference on. Um, so I've been spending a lot of time on that. Um, I've been spending a lot of time on the VS Code extension for Kubernetes. I've been really enjoying um, working inside the IDE and trying to sort of integrate Kubernetes and the IDE together. Right. Um, also, a lot of time and energy on the um, uh, virtual kubelet, virtual node stuff. That's been trying to figure out how we marry serverless infrastructure up with Kubernetes. Um, that's been well, a big effort. This show come out after your talk, so give us maybe. Uh, oh, my talk is like way down in the weeds. Let's, uh, go, let's go in the weeds. Let's, uh, go, let's go in the weeds there. On so I'm gonna do some live. I'm gonna do some live coding. I'm gonna do a PR. My first first PR in a talk actually. I've never right? done it before, so okay. I'm gonna, it's gonna be an experiment. Um, and by way of experiment, I'm, I'm gonna show the complexity of of how we build these libraries, starting with a GitHub issue that's sitting out there, because. Somebody wants to use um, our generated library to uh, proxy a request, and, and they find out that they can only do gets, and they can't put bodies, they can't do posts or puts, and, they, and this sort of thing. And they file an issue, and they go, like, why can't I do this? Well, so all of our libraries are built from uh, open API specifications. So it's a JSON specification for an API. Um, that the Kubernetes community puts out. You take it, you put it into a code generator, it generates a whole bunch of code. And that tool, actually, we don't control. It's an open, another open source project. And so to fix this bug, uh, what I'm going to do in the talk is we have to make a change to the open API specification. We have to rerun that code generator. We have to then take that code generated code, check it into the, the client library repository, build that client library repository, and then push it out to like Maven and these you know, code, code, code library things. And so it's like this very small thing that turns into a bunch of different stages in this pipeline. And, and just to explain why, you know, it's the only way we can keep up with the project. Right? There's always these new API types being added in. There's always new you know, data fields and whatnot. Um, and so if we didn't use a code generator, and you see this actually, because there are people out there who have handwritten Kubernetes client libraries. And over time, they just get further and further out of date. And they get further and further out of date because it's just exhausting to try and keep up. So that the only way you can do it is through these code generators. But if you use the code generator, then suddenly you're beholden to the features that are supported by the code generator, to the quality of the API spec, which is, has some gaps, the quality of the of Swagger or OpenAPI itself, which has gone through a couple different versions to fix some problems. Um, so that's that's sort of what the whole talk is about. It's going to be very much in the sausage making, like how the sausage is made category. Of so like, who's who's the person that should not miss that, or if they're listening later, they should uh, go on YouTube and find the talk. I mean, I think anybody who's interested in non GoLang client, no coding to the Kubernetes API in a language that's not Go, right. that's who we're really aimed at. Okay. Um, and actually, ultimately, we may very well be aimed at Go as well because the existing Go client library is. Um, a, a, a constant source of pain and friction for developers because when you import it, you basically import three quarters of the Kubernetes tree just to import a client library. So it's way too heavy. Um, so there's some amount of work to see if actually we should move to one of these generated client libraries for more uh, sort of smaller scale uh, Go programmers who want to communicate with Kubernetes. Um, so, and then there's also consistency. So, like one of the other things you realize when you start doing this is um, how the system loads like a cube config file, like the config file that describes how to talk to your cluster. It's not documented anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. It's only in the code, right? And so, but suddenly, like you're writing client libraries for six different languages, and somebody says, "Hey, cube control works, Go works, but your Java library doesn't work," right? And you're like. Why not? And you figure out, oh, it's because like this system looks in this path, and we didn't implement that for that over here. Or you know, 
Go loads JSON or YAML in a specific way where that becomes a string. And in Java, Java tries to put that into a Boolean or, you know, whatever it happens to be. Like, and, and so it's been an interesting exercise as well in understanding these places in the project where the only documentation is the implementation um, and, and having to take that apart. And honestly, I wish I'd contributed back more documentation than I had. Usually it's just pointers. Usually mm -hmm. in the code I just say, hey, the only place this is documented is in the code over here where I found it. Right. right. And, you know, um, point point back to that. Does that, does um, that make you want to go write some docs for it? Does it that totally make does. It, does. And then it? like I'll reference earlier the lack of time. Right. Um, my nights and weekends are taken up by this. Also I bought Red Dead Redemption. So like my night are my nights and weekends what are What is that? Red Dead Redemption? Oh it's a video game. Okay. It's a high quality I have I wish I was more of a gamer. I'm just, I'm just not. I, I get into it, but I'm not like hardcore gamer. I'm not like hardcore, but sometimes there's a game and it just takes up my life for like four months. Right, gotcha. So and that's this one right now. So I have that, but it's been from like my teenage years. Like I will play Castlevania Symphony of the Night <sighs> nice. any day. Nice. Like I'll go back and nice. replay the original that's Castlevania, good. but for some reason, I just don't get into modern gaming as much. Maybe because yeah, I'm older, yeah. I don't know what it is, but. I For some know. reason, it just doesn't intrigue yeah, me as much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The open world stuff, I Maybe love. Maybe my son isn't old enough yet. He's still, you know, almost, yeah, yeah, he's yeah. going to be three soon, so I mean, he's not into it. Yeah, yeah, Maybe, yeah, when, yeah. maybe when it becomes a, a dad and son thing, or, yeah, although I, or I, a daughter and, and yeah, father I don't, thing. I don't, uh, I only play Mario Kart with the kids. Yeah. Know, like. <laughs> Definitely got to play games with the kids. Yeah. I'll, uh, let's, let's laugh a little on the way out All of right. this conversation. And so I'm, I'm looking at your Twitter feed recently. All right. And I, and I, am I seeing it pronounced, am I pronounced it correctly when I say, is it Fiffy? Fippy. 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 So yeah. I'm seeing The PHP Fippy. app. The PHP app. Fippy the, Fippy the friendly PHP app. Okay. So this, this, uh, giraffe, right? Yep. Giraffe. Is everywhere. She's, yeah. Awesome. What's it's, up with that? So well, have you seen the, the backstory? The Children's Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes. I've seen that, yes. So Fippy is the main character right. in the Children's Illustrated Guide to Kubernetes. Um, we had a volume two this this at KubeCon. So Fippy goes to so the this zoo. Year's next this year, volume this year's two? volume two. I saw it last year. Yeah. Okay. Fippy goes to the zoo, um, introducing a few more parts of Kubernetes. Uh, ingress and a few other few other parts. Um, and we also announced that uh, we're actually donating um, so, so all of that was originally created by Deus, uh, which was a startup. Microsoft acquired Deus right. uh, a few years back. Um, and as part of that acquisition, we got Fippy and the stories and all this. Um, so actually at KubeCon this year, uh, we announced that we're donating all of that to the CNCF. Um, so all of the intellectual property, all of the graphics and all wow. that stuff donated to the CNCF. Story donated to the CNCF. Yeah. Um, so there's actually Fippy.io. Um, and you can go there and, and get the PDFs and all that sort of stuff. And uh, so as, as a sort of tribute to all of that um, and a tribute to the fact that KubeCon had come to my hometown, um, you know, I, I'm a native Seattleite, born and, born and bred. Um, uh, I decided to take Fippy on a little bit of a tour this past weekend. And so uh, a lot of the places that... that you know the tourists or people. Who, I when I have visitors, the places I take, right, take them around Seattle. I uh, I took Fippy around to all those. I places, dug that. So. I, I think that's a really cool idea. I wasn't sure what made you do it. I was I was hoping for some of this context. Yeah, it was because we knew we were donating it, obviously. Right. So and I don't know if you saw the keynote, but um, Matt Butcher um, and uh, Karen Chu, who are who are some of the people who are, who are responsible for developing this whole thing, um, while they were at Deus, actually got to do a reading. Uh, in the keynote, they did a reading of Volume Two up on the stage. So nice. it was it was pretty awesome. So if, if you, your listeners didn't get a chance to check that out, they should check out the live stream of the keynotes from uh, KubeCon and uh, see the live the 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 reading of uh, Kubernetes, the Children's Illustrated Guide, Volume Two. Fippy goes to the zoo. So if you go so, to what was it uh, Fippy. P H I P P Y dot I O Fippy dot I O. So yeah. you got Fippy and friends here. You got Goldie Z. Goldie is based on the original Gopher. Yep. Z and Captain Cube. Captain Cube. Captain yeah. Cube. Captain Cube. Captain Cube always looks a little grumpy. I don't know. I'm trying to cheer him up, but it's the eyebrows. Sorry, it's the eyebrows. It's the eyebrows. It's, it's, it's the, the eyebrows. furrow. Yeah, it's the, like, it's, you got a furrow brow. You're gonna see him like look, he looks a little grumpy. Yeah. Yeah. I was gonna uh, say he's that's, the stern captain. I guess we'll put that in the show notes. But that's also where you can download and or read Volume One and Volume Two that's as well. Right. Yep. Okay. Well, that's right. Check I, that out. I happen to have a printed copy because I was here last year. And we got a. We have Where do you get printed copies at? Is it online uh, or just here at the, the Azure booth? Okay. If you're at KubeCon. I guess this is going to go out after yeah. KubeCon. Yeah. So, too late. But so we'll have. For we'll listeners, have a future. How do they get it? Um, 
Is it even know. possible? I don't know that you can get. I mean, we, we have it at conference swag, and, yeah. and I imagine CNCF at future conferences will have it. So yeah. you know, come check out the booths. And I gotta go buy because I have to get one to future conferences. And we these have, things are gonna be worth money one day. We have uh, if some, not already. We have some stuffies as well. So and you can buy the stuffies at the CNCF store as well. So those will probably be available online. Um, but, Did you happen uh, to see Julia Evans? I uh, know. Uh, illustration from last year? No, I don't. Oh, oh yeah, yes. I've seen I've seen some of that stuff. I, I have um, a, for whatever reason, the conferences over last year, they still had a huge stack. I want to say maybe like 25 of them. And oh, wow. I've been thinking like, what can I, I want to keep one for me because I've got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I bought my, my, my own mic here. I got one of them framed, ready to go up on the wall because I want to use it as wall art in my, in my studio. Right. But then the others, I'm like, I got like 25 or 30 of these things. So yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. if you're listening to this, yeah, you know, reach out. We'll see if we can send ship them you out. one somehow. But That's right. Roll it in a tube and ship and it off. Cargo it out there. That sounds good. So, Well, Brent, it was, it was a pleasure to catch up with you. Always Absolutely. like sort of get a, a snapshot of where things are going. I feel like yeah. you're, you're like um, such a great person to talk about, obviously, because you, you play such a key role in it, but you see things at a different level than... I think most people get a chance to sure in, in this community, so it's sure. it's really interesting to get sure. that. Anything that I may not have asked you in closing that you're like, man, I just I, I got to share this. Uh, Don't let it leave without that. No, I think we did a pretty good job actually. Okay. I mean, I'm glad we got the fifty thing in at the end. So uh, cool. Let's leave it there. Thank yeah. you so much for your time. I appreciate it. It's always always a pleasure to catch up with you. Absolutely. Thanks, Thanks so much. Man. Right, that's it for this episode of the change law we're back 2019 is here i'm excited about it and i hope you are too do us a favor share the show with a friend email it link it up on twitter blog about it go into apple podcasts and rate and review it go into overcast and favorite it whatever you gotta do do us a favor and share this show of course thank you to our sponsors linode clubhouse and raygun and of course thank you to fastly for our bandwidth Check them out at Fastly.com. And we move fast and fix things around here at ChangeLaw because of Rollbar. Check them out at Rollbar.com. And we're hosted on Linode Cloud Servers. Head to Linode.com slash ChangeLog. This episode was mixed, edited, and mastered by me. Music is by Breakmaster Cylinder. And if you want to hear more episodes like this, subscribe to our master feed at ChangeLog.com slash master. Or go into your podcast app and search for Change Law Master. You'll find it. Subscribe. Get all of our shows as well as some extras that only hit the master feed. Thanks again for listening. Welcome to 2019. And we'll see you again soon.